Magandang umaga sa lahat. That's, that's about as far as I can go, and I'm probably in trouble there. But I'll start there. Well, again, good day to everyone in Cebu, all around the world. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Father Ariel, for the orientation, for all that you are doing for the Flame of Love in the Philippines. Already, the Philippines is having quite an impact on the world. So thank you all. May I ask us, let's take a moment, and as I often do, may I ask us to pause in silence, and I ask you to pray for me, that I may speak to you whatever the Lord wishes, not anything that I would wish to say. So let's pause for a moment and ask the Lord for his blessing on this. I always chuckle a little bit when I when I ask people to do that, and I do often. I think they're they're really praying for themselves. I'll I'll just be embarrassed. They'll be bored. But uh, let us let us look at this topic. This topic that Father Ariel and Father Torres asked me to cover, of the prayers. And there's one point that I'll leave you beyond all as we talk about the prayers, and that point is to live the prayers. Live the prayers so much more than to say the prayers or to pray the prayers, but to live the prayers. So let's speak of these prayers that we have in the flame of love. I like to, if I have time, I'll try to address this in three different stages. First to address the prayers, then to address the relationship between the prayers and how they all work together. And then if there's still time, how the prayers lead us to the practices of the flame of love. And even before we start with the flame of love, Hail Mary, and the unity prayer, I'd like to step back just one more place to its very foundation, because there are three things that we were given in the flame of love regarding our prayer life. The unity prayer, the flame of love, Hail Mary, but also the meditation on the five wounds. Now that's not quite a, a prayer, it's a meditation and and truly can be prayed as a meditation and should be prayed as a meditation. I know in the prayer cynical outlines, we have the uh, kiss the wound of your sacred left hand with sorrow deep and true, kiss the right hand of your uh, wound of your sacred right hand with sorrow deep and true. And that is a beautiful prayer. It's not in the diary. It is just a prayer. I believe it's been adapted that um, there is a good Friday prayer that goes, I kiss the wound of your sacred head with sorrow deep and true, may every thought of my mind today be an act of perfect love for you. I kiss the wounds of your sacred feet with sorrow deep and true. May every step I take today be an act of perfect love for you. And it goes on and on through the wounds. And again, the meditating upon the wounds of Jesus is not again necessarily a new thing. It was actually a devotion of Saint Clair of Assisi. But we are asked to meditate upon these wounds. And when I talk about how the prayers relate to each other, you'll see why. And it is indeed a meditation. Let me, let me share screen here briefly, just so you can see where these come from. And I'll share this complete desktop over here. Here is where Jesus mentions, do not be distracted when you make the sign of the cross. Think about the three divine persons, make the sign of the cross five times while thinking of my five wounds, a meditation. Always look at my eyes, bigger than blood from so many blows that I received even from you. And Mary herself saying, start making the sign of the cross five times. This is the beginning of the family cynicals. Offering yourselves to the eternal father through the wounds of my divine son. Do the same as the conclusion. Sign yourself this way when you get up and when you go to bed and during the day. This will bring you closer to the eternal father through my divine son, filling your heart with graces. So again, the, the importance of meditating upon these wounds. In fact, it was very interesting. Just uh, a week ago, we had a leader cynical in the perpetual vigil room. 
And it was beautiful. At the end, Father Arya was leading the meditation on the five wounds. And he started with, let's kiss, maybe you know, we kiss the wound of your sacred left hand. We kiss the wound of your sacred right hand, your left foot, your right foot. And then he broke into the most moving and impassioned meditation on the wound of Jesus' side. So I encourage you all to make that a true meditation. I do. When I wake up in the morning, that's the first thing that I'm doing. When I go to bed, it's the last thing I'm doing at night because it is so rich and it is the foundation for all of the other prayers because in the meditation of the five wounds, we, are, we root ourselves in the mercy and love of God from which all grace flows. God himself is love. Where love encounters need, that is mercy. And then because God sees our needs, the answer to our needs is grace. So we have God's love, his mercy, and his grace. And so the, the meditation of the five wounds roots us there. When we look upon those, again, it's, it's a deep meditation. You can Sometimes I'm meditating on that in the morning when I go to sleep, and suddenly 15 minutes have gone by. And I think those of you who have prayed in Senec with me say, yes, we know. We know, John, we've heard you do that. But it is so rich. When you think of Jesus on the cross, and the free choice he had to make to stay there. This is going to tie to the unity prayer and to the flame of love, Hail Mary. Remember, Jesus is God. He can be transfigured on the mount. Without even the blink of an eye, he can, he can create a new universe. Every single time he had to gasp for breath, he had to choose to stay and not say, enough of these people. Enough of these. They spit on me. They beat me. They nailed me to the cross. Be done with them. They're gone. Let's start over again. Every single time he had to choose. Every time his shoulder was in excruciating pain from being wrenched and torn and supporting his body weight on the cross. Every time the nails were against the bones of his wrists holding up his weight. Every time he, the bones in his legs were pushing against the nails to push himself up so that he could breathe. Every single time. He had the freedom to say, I'm done. And every single time in love, he chose to stay. And those of you who have had a chance to go through the basic series on suffering, we talk about the inseparable connection between love, freedom, and suffering. That for love to be perfect, it must be free. And the freedom of love is built in the crucible of suffering. So when we meditate upon these wounds, Let's look upon the free choice that Jesus always made to love us and to save us. So this brings us to the other prayers. So in, in the flame of love, Hail Mary, we have this petition to spread the effect of grace of your flame of love over all of humanity. We're in the process of finally being able to translate the complete diary, the handwritten diary, or the critical edition of the handwritten diary, from Hungarian directly into English. The current translation we have is from an extract that was made because it was hard to get the diary out of Hungary and under communism that was translated into Spanish and then into English. And we're learning a lot. We're learning that, for example, that word when, when Mary asked to spread for us, asked us to ask her to spread the effect of grace of the flame of love over all of humanity is much, much stronger than just the word spread. In fact, as we were asking them, what, what is the right word to use for this in English? Is it the same word that's used in, for example, the Angelus prayer? You know, pour forth, we beseech you, O Lord, your grace into our hearts. And they said, no, it's even stronger than that. It's really the word that comes from flood. It's asking Mary to flood all of mankind with the effect of grace, a very powerful one. You remember Father Ariel mentioned the, the, the vibrancy, the, the radiance of Jesus, the flame of love in Mary's heart that it is just bursting forth, flooding forth upon the earth, this powerful effect of grace. Now, something else we have learned along the way, we often speak of the fact that, yes, here is a change to the Hail Mary, and people wonder, how can that be? And we point out to them that the Hail Mary itself has indeed been changed um, in, in the past. And we point out to them that the original Hail Mary looked very different from the Hail Mary that we have today. 
In fact, it's, we find this in the breviary itself, that in the breviary of the church, the public prayer that the priests and the, and the religious and laity can pray as well. In ordinary time, there is a, a reading from uh, Bishop Baldwin of Canterbury from about 1150 AD. And he talks about praying the Hail Mary, about saying every morning we honor the Blessed Mother with the angel salutation. And sometimes we add, blessed is the fruit of your womb. So interesting that here we see in the very early records of the church in the breviary itself, that the Hail Mary was just hail full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And as you say, it was about 350 years later that St. Bernardine of Siena added the names of Jesus and Mary. And about a hundred years after that, that we added the whole second half of the Hail Mary. But something that we have learned recently that we didn't realize before is that, uh, that the evaluation of the Hail Mary, of, of the flame of love that was made when Cardinal Erdu uh, approved it, had something very specific to say about the Hail Mary. And their point was a little different than we have been saying that the Mariologist who did the examination and did the theological evaluation made a, a very specific point that we're not asking for a change for Hail Mary. Mary is actually asking for a new prayer derived from it. Let me read you his words because they're quite important for us to understand. And hopefully I'll share my screen the correct way this time. You'll see here that at the end of book four, there are four books in the handwritten diary. An important notice is in indicated that according to the assumed bidding of the Blessed Virgin, the second half of the Hail Mary should sound as follows. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners and pour out the graces of your flame of love to all mankind. Again, various ways to translate it, now and at the hour of our death. But he's very, very clearly notes that at this request, however, one cannot think that this would be the only correct way to pray the Hail Mary. Even Elizabeth herself did not dare write this down for 21 years. And it's a serious question because it concerns one of the best known Marian prayers of the church. But there is no problem providing we consider this bidding as optional, as a unique prayer only to a certain spirituality, but not compulsory for anyone in the church. And that even though it starts from the traditional text of the Hail Mary, it creates a new prayer, but it does not affect the original prayer and does not require anyone to change it. So the matter is solved. So he mentions this a second time. That's just, this is how important it is to him. He says, we must mark that the praying of the Hail Mary with the addition is neither a correction of, nor an addition to the original, nor some variant of it, but a self-sufficing prayer independent from the original Ave Maria. So that's a perspective that we perhaps have not emphasized as much as we, uh, as we have in the past. Now the prayer itself is of course giving great blessings. As we've heard, uh, when we pray this, the Hail Mary, with reference to the flame of love, that Mary promised that every three times we pray that, that a soul would be released from purgatory, that in November, 10 souls would be released from purgatory because she wants the effect of grace to be able to spread even to the dying. But more important is what it is asking, that Mary is asking for the effects of grace to affect all of mankind, to indeed flood over all of mankind. As Father Ariel mentioned, this is the movement of grace and grace is everything to the church. So more important than just saying the Hail Mary, as I say, is to live the Hail Mary, that we must live the effects of grace. Tell me in, in any prayer, what is more important? The request that we make or the fulfillment of the request that we make? Is it more important that we pray spread the effect of grace of the flame of love over all mankind, or that we receive the answer to that prayer and that the effect of grace does indeed flow over all of mankind? Is it more important that we pray, may our feet journey together, or that our feet actually do journey together? 
So we'll come back to this in a moment, but how important it is for us to live the effect of grace, to live the prayer that we ask. And then, of course, we come to the unity prayer. It's beautiful, beautiful unity prayer. And in this prayer, as I said, Jesus expresses his deepest desire toward us. That, in effect, it is his prayer to us, for us, about us. But it's very, very easy to misunderstand this prayer. This prayer that says, may our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the eternal Father. Well, let's start right at the beginning. You'll notice that um, we often, when we pray the prayer, we begin with the statement, my adorable Jesus. And people have pointed out, and rightly so, just in case anyone asks you, that that's not a part of the prayer. Rather, that's a section that we added in the United States as we realized people were misunderstanding the prayer. And they began to think that this prayer about may our feet walk to journey together, may our hands gather in unity, was about us as a community being in unity. And it's not. So we wanted to make it clear that it was Jesus. And Jesus asked for this word himself, this address himself, only asked for it slightly differently. And in fact, you'll find as we go forward, we'll be changing a little bit how we, we say it. Rather than saying my adorable Jesus, we'll be saying my adored Jesus. And there are two reasons for that. One is in English, the, the, the word adorable literally means you know, worthy of worship, but we've tended to make it cute and cuddly like that adorable puppy or that adorable dress that you're wearing. Um, but what Jesus actually says on January 2nd, 1963, he says, say and repeat, my adored Jesus, my adored Jesus. In Latin, adorare is to worship, my worshiped Jesus. Say and constantly repeat, my adored Jesus. I have told you before how pleasant it is to me. And even if you say nothing else for a whole hour, repeat it with repentance for your sins. This obtains many graces, forgiveness of sins, and provides peace for souls. So my adored Jesus tells us to whom, with whom, we are praying this prayer. But now it's very easy to get the direction of this prayer wrong. It's easy to misunderstand this prayer as asking Jesus into our lives. That's not what this prayer is about. This prayer is about Jesus asking us into his life. So for example, later in the diary, he clarifies many parts of this prayer. And he says, uh, let's see, I think I'll, I'll share my screen. If I get it into the right place, I'll walk through this with you. You'll notice that Jesus clarifies some of these thoughts. So when he says, may our feet journey together, he tells us where. He says, you suffer, do you not? Suffer for me. This is my gift. You can only receive suffering like this from me. Whether the suffering is spiritual or bodily, accept it from pure love for me. You know what I told you. We must go up to Calvary. May our feet journey together. Just a little later, he says, my little Carmelite, your continual sacrifices give witness to your continual fidelity to me and to my work of salvation. These make you walk on the path of martyrdom. Do not fear our feet journey together. And even though you grieve, let us continue walking together. So this is a critically important point. It is not us asking Jesus to come into our life. That's a good thing. That's what we want to do. But this is something more profound. This takes us to a deeper level of spirituality. How often we want to invite Jesus' life into our life to lighten our burdens, to make things easier. But Jesus is really inviting us in the flame of love as the effect of grace to mount the cross, to walk with him to Calvary. And again, this is nothing new. 
This is something that we see very, very clearly in the scriptures. Let me again share a Bible with you. A critically important part of scripture. Let's go all the way over to Luke 9 and verse 22. Where Jesus is saying that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised on the third day. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. Now, again, we don't see crucifixions nowadays, but in the Roman world, they knew exactly what this meant. If you were taking up your cross, you weren't coming back. So when we are invited into Jesus's life, which was a march to give up his life for others. And so we, by the effect of grace, are called to take up Jesus's life. That's what this whole prayer is about. It's not about Jesus coming to help us. It's about Jesus inviting us to help him to save souls, just like Father Ariel was saying. This flame of love is not about us. It's not about us feeling happy and good and renewed and fulfilled and wonderful, although those are all the things that will happen. It's about us working hand in hand with Jesus and with our Blessed Mother to save souls and to do whatever it takes to save souls. That's what the unity prayer is about. And he says, may our feet journey together, he says to Calvary. May our hands gather in unity. He's talking about souls. May our hearts beat in unison is a profound statement. In that statement, he tells us exactly what he means later on in the diary. He says, I let myself be known to you as true God and true man. Not only you, but all those who eat my body and drink my blood. Right? Remember, we're invited into the life of Jesus. That's what Eucharist does. As true God, I penetrate your heart. And as true man, I speak to you because my human heart beats to the same rhythm as my divinity. Your heart beats to the same rhythm as my heart. Do you know what this means? It means that you participate in my divinity. This is what grace is about. Maybe now we're starting to see how the prayers come together. That the effect of grace is to make Jesus alive in us, to become one with him, to be truly unified with him so that we partake of divinity. We partake of the very life of God. So we begin to think and feel and act and be as God is. In fact, the next line of the unity prayer is a very difficult one to, to translate into, into English from the Hungarian. But when we understand what it's trying to say in Hungarian, we see how this, this follows on from what we've just said. We partake of the divinity so that we think and feel and act as God does, as Jesus does. The next line that we said, may our souls um, be in harmony, is really not what Jesus is saying. He's not talking about souls. We don't have a good word for this in English. He's really talking about our insides. In, in old English, we talk about bowels of compassion. We kind of laugh at that nowadays, but it's that place deep, deep inside you where you have your deepest feelings. And the Hungarian basically says all the way in the very inside of our being, our gut feelings, may they feel together. In other words, may we feel and think and act the same way you and me feel like I do with my desire to save souls. That's why our lips plead together to the eternal father for his mercy, not for us, for others, for their salvation. And so now we can talk about how the prayers begin to work together. So picture this now. We start with the meditation on the five wounds which roots us in the mercy and the love of God from which all things come. In response to his love for us, because of his love for us, because of the mercy he has upon our need, he bestows our grace. Spread the effect of grace over all of humanity. What is the effect of grace? 
The effect of grace, the final outcome of grace, is to make Jesus alive in us. This is why I say Christianity is not a religion like other religions. It's not one of many that we go into the, the, the religion store and choose and say, I, I, want to, I want to try Buddhism this week, and I'm bored of that. I'm going to try Zen next week, and maybe I'll try Islam next month, and now I'm going to give Christianity a try. That's not what Christianity is. It's not a religion like other religions. We're not Christians because we follow the teachings of Jesus. Like a Buddhist would be the, a Buddhist because he follows the teachings of the great Buddha or a, a Hindu would be a Hindu because they follow the teachings of the, of the wise Brahmins of the past. No, that, that makes us a catechumen. It doesn't make us a Christian. We're not Christians because we imitate the example of Jesus. We're Christians because Jesus literally lives in us to change our very nature from human nature to the divine nature. Now, this is a huge topic. Hopefully someday, if, if Father uh, Torres and Father Ariel are willing, we might do a whole day uh, retreat, a mission on this concept alone to understand grace. Because if we don't understand grace, we won't understand the flame of love. But what grace does, all the forms of grace are to lead us to partaking of the divine life so we can think and feel and act and be as God is, so that we can love God the same way God has loved within himself for forever. So what is the final effect of grace? It's the unity prayer. The effect of grace is to bring us to the unity prayer. The unity prayer is the heart of the flame of love. And not only that, the unity prayer is the heart of Christianity. The flame of love is not a devotion like other devotions. It's not something else. The flame of love lies right at the heart of Christianity. And in fact, let me go here now at this next step. What the flame of love is enabling us to do on its way to blinding Satan is to refocus on the true and full meaning of the gospel. So again, let's tie the prayers together step by step. The love of God leads to his mercy, shown to us in the love and mercy on the cross. We meditate upon the five wounds. So he pours his grace upon us so that the effect of grace is spread over all of humanity so that they can partake of the divine life and come to union with Jesus in the unity prayer. When Jesus is present in our life, what happens to Satan's influence? It's absolutely destroyed and driven out. Satan is blinded. And what's the final outcome when the influence of evil is broken and destroyed from the world? The salvation of souls. It's the gospel. Can we see how in the prayers of the flame of love, Jesus and Mary have made the gospel accessible and understandable to everyone. When you pray the five, meditate upon the five wounds, pray, spread the effect of grace of the flame of love over all of humanity. Pray the unity prayer so that we blind Satan and save souls. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. That's the church we were always supposed to be. So now let's take this to the next step. Let's think about again what the gospel is and see how, again, the prayers will lead us right to this gospel. Now, when we think of what it is sometimes we the gospel seems to become so diffuse we can't define it very well but very simply put the good news that that jesus brought to the world the good news that christianity makes happen is that god is sharing his divine life through jesus that's it god is sharing his divine life through jesus now let's break that down a little bit and we'll see how that comes back to the prayers of the of the flame of love we start with the God who is love, right? First John 4, 8. Many, you'll find many of these references out of John. John's gospel is, is wonderful. It, it is, is a gospel that was given to help clarify things. There wasn't anything wrong with the earlier gospels of Mark and Matthew and Luke. Those were earlier than John. They were perfectly fine. But people began to misunderstand them a little bit and take them in a direction they shouldn't go. And so John's gospel helps bring clarity to what exactly the gospel is. And John's letters do the same. So we start with the God who is love, right? First John 4, 8. God is love. And because he is love, in his mercy, he gave the word to be made flesh through the Virgin Mary. That's the very next 
verse after 1 John 4, 8. Right, if we go to this beautiful letter of St. John, I won't be sharing my screen just to save time because we're getting a little close here. I'll just read them to you. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live in him. God is sharing his life through Jesus. Jesus was made flesh so that we could participate in the divine life, right? That towering prologue to John, John 1 and verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. So in his mercy, he gave the word to be made flesh through the Virgin Mary, so that in the literal body of Jesus, humanity is joined to divinity. Remember he said in John 6, it was scandalous, unless you eat my flesh, chew on my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. It's in the literal body of Jesus that our humanity is joined to divinity. That's why Jesus is the way. And there is no other way than through Jesus. When Jesus became man, he made a marriage between God and man. He is true God and true man. Together, our only path to be joined to divinity is through the union of humanity and divinity found in the literal body of Jesus. So that by the effect of grace, all people can be joined to the divine life of the Trinity through union with Jesus. See where this is going? See how the gospel is tied right to the prayers. This is the high priestly prayer, again, in the gospel of John, John 17 and verse 21. Jesus prays that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, how God is within himself that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Again, Jesus is everything. That's why the unity prayer, which comes about by the effect of grace to the mercy of God is so important. So that brought into complete and literal union with Jesus by the effect of grace, we can love God and each other as God has always love within the trinity that's the conclusion of the high priestly prayer the very last words that jesus is praying before being taken captive and suffering and dying for us the very last words that he's speaking are that itself he says and i have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you loved me may be in them we get how incredible that statement is. We read it over and over. And we don't maybe grasp what that means. That the love with which you, the Father, loved me, the Word, may be in them. That can't happen except by grace. We can't love the way God loves. That's why we can't live in eternity. That's why we need to leave behind our human love and our human good and partake of the divine good by the effect of grace, because that's the only way that we can love the way that God has loved. So that the love with which you, the Father, love me, the word, may be in them. Can we see the wonder, the awe, what God is doing is just mind blowing. Yes, so we can love God as God has always loved within the Trinity. And thus loving as God loves, enter eternal life of the most blessed Trinity. That's what happens when we are in the very body of Jesus. Towards the end of the letter of St. John, 1 John 5 and verse 11. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son only through Jesus. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. It's that clear. And by our complete union with Jesus, by the effect of grace, Satan's influence is destroyed. Again, 1 John 3 and verse 8, the one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. That's what happens when Jesus is alive in us through grace. And the final outcome 
is that souls are saved, right? Why did Jesus come? Why does he come in us to join himself to us in the unity prayer so we can continue his work of salvation? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So can we see how the prayers of the flame of love tell us what the gospel is? By the mercy of God, he has spread his grace upon us. He has flooded humanity with his grace. That's what we're asking for. Spread the effective grace of your flame of love over all humanity so that they can come to the unity prayer so that we can be Jesus and therefore love God the way that God loves forever and partake of eternal life. Now let's make the last critical turn. So now we understand the prayers. We understand how the prayers tie together and how when we put the prayers together, we, we have now spoken the gospel, so to speak, for everyone, the gospel for everyone. Remember where I started. I said, it's not enough to just pray the prayers. We must live the prayers. We must live the prayers. Now, the prayers themselves have the power to blind Satan. Right? Mary told us, Jesus told us, the, the, when we pray with reference to the flame of love, Satan is blinded. When we pray the unity prayer, Satan is blinded. But there are other things that blind Satan, right? Mass and adoration. And even we were told by our Blessed Mother that our everyday work and our chores can blind Satan as well. I'm just trying to see if I can grab a quick reference to that from the diary. I don't have it handy, but um, oh yes, it is. Here it is. Mary says, throughout the day, you should offer me your daily chores for the glory of God. Such offering made in a state of grace also contributes to blind Satan. Live in accordance with my graces so that Satan will be blinded even more and in an increasingly large range of action. Take advantage of the abundant graces to make a multitude of souls live a holier life. So now let's, kind of, let's complete the, the, the drawing here. So we have the meditation of the five wounds roots us in the mercy of God. We then implore our blessed mother to flood humanity with grace. Why? So that we can come to union with Jesus. And what happens when we come to union with Jesus? When instead of inviting him into our life to make our lives better, we are saying, yes, Lord, I want to enter into your life. I want to be just like you. I want you to live in me to save souls. And that's why he invites us into pouring out our lives to others. Sometimes we look at the practices of the flame of love and we say, this seems so extreme. Why are we supposed to fast so much? Why are we supposed to get up at night and keep vigil? Why are we supposed to make our meals tasteless as an offering for others? Why are we supposed to give up all the entertainments and all the TV shows we like and all the magazines we like to read and all the music we like to listen to so that we can spend the time in prayer and service? Why? Because in Jesus' life, is there ever a time when he is selfish? Ever? For all eternity? No. For God is love, and the opposite of love is self. Either we live for love or we live for self. When we choose for self, when we choose the food we eat for ourselves, when we choose the clothes we wear for ourselves, when we choose the way we use our money for ourselves, when we choose the way we use our time for ourselves, we are living for ourselves. If we are fully invited into the life of Jesus, what we do with our time, our money, our food, our clothing, everything we do is now about other. Jesus is calling us to something special in the flame of love. He's calling us to fully live the gospel, not superficially live the gospel, fully live the gospel. Remember when the rich young man comes to Jesus and he says, good master, what must I do to receive eternal life? And Jesus says, keep the commandments. 
And he says, which? And Jesus goes through the commandments and he says, well, I've done all that. Okay, that's that very superficial level of Christianity that says, what do I have to do? Remember what Jesus says to him next? He said, Jesus loved him. Jesus loved him and wants to offer him something more. And he says, if you would be perfect. Now tell me, how many of you want to be perfect? Be careful what you ask for, right? How many of you want to be perfect? Hopefully all of us. But do our actions match our words? If you want to be perfect, sell everything you have, he says. Give it to the poor and come follow me. If you want to be perfect, if you truly want to be holy, give your entire life to Jesus so that he will give his life for the salvation of souls. This is how the practices are tied to the prayers. The practices of the flame of love teach us how to pour out every moment of our life for others, how to make every decision for love so that we don't just say, spread the effective grace of your flame of love over all mankind. We are living the effect of grace. So we don't just pray, may our feet journey together, may our thoughts be as one, may our insides feel the same. But we live it. Our feet do journey to Calvary. We do give up our lives. We do take up our cross so that everything about our lives is to bring joy to our Lord Jesus by saving souls. Hopefully this ties it all together as we wrap it up. That in the prayers of the flame of love, we see the gospel itself. Starting from God's mercy, he sends us his grace to bring us into union with his son so that we can live as God loves and partake of his very life, which blinds Satan and drives out his influence and saves souls. And if that's what we pray, that's what we live. And so we change our lives by the power of grace to make all of our lives poured out for others. Every choice, a choice for love with wisdom, you know, but every choice is a choice for love. When we do that, when we go beyond, what do I have to do? Okay, I'm going to keep some commandments. I'm going to be a nice person. I'm going to go to church on Sunday and hope I get to heaven. No, when all of our life becomes pouring out our lives and loves for others, people will notice that. Right? This is the great miracle that Mary said she would do. The great miracle would not be another Fatima or another Lourdes or another Guadalupe. The great miracle would be when countless families are filled with grace. How do you know a holy person? How do you know a family that's filled with grace? They live for others. When you encounter someone who's holy, it's like you're the most important person on earth. Their entire thought, their entire focus is on you, not how they're coming across, not how they look, not how whether the tie is straight. Or is, it, is it this way? <laughs> you know, not, their entire thought is about you. That's how you know you're in the presence of a holy person. When the world sees Jesus in us, because we have been willing to sacrifice everything that we want to take for ourselves to instead pour ourselves out for others, the world will see the light of Jesus. And when the light of Jesus shines in people who truly live the gospel, who truly live every moment in love as Jesus does, who love their fellow man as God the Father loves Jesus and Jesus loves the Father, that light will blind Satan. They will see what the truth looks like. They will see Jesus full of grace and truth in you and in me by the power of grace. And that miracle will change the world. It's that miracle that is the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. At Fatima, Mary told us what would happen. In the end, her Immaculate Heart would triumph. But she didn't tell us how. But the flame of love tells us how. By grace. By the effect of grace, bringing us into union with Jesus, so that our lives live our prayers, and people see the light of Jesus. Their eyes are open and Satan is blinded. So please, my brothers and sisters, don't just pray the prayers of the flame of love. Live the prayers. Thank you all. Thank you for praying for me.